And with me on the floor is our next speaker, Klaus Gramman, who will help us understand what is the best approach when using independent component analysis for EEG and mobile EEG data cleaning. Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martha. And thank you, Urosh, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again um, in Koper. And I'm going to talk about um, Mobi data cleaning. Um, and the question here that we have experienced over the years is always like, how many ICs can we remove? How many ICs should we remove? When I talk about ICs, I talk about independent components. And most of the analysis um, that we are doing in our lab in Berlin is based on independent component analysis. I'm going to talk about that um, in a few minutes, um, very briefly. I'm going to give you a short overview of EEG and MOBI, and then um, talk and dive a little bit into the neuroanatomy and physiology underlying EEG with a focus on spatial filtering. Um, Valentina has been talking about the physiological origins of EEG, um, so you know about where, where the signal comes from and how it basically looks like. Um, so I will just use that as a recap to dive into spatial filters and why ICA does what it does and how we can use it actually then to clean the data. Um, I will talk a little bit about volume conduction and spatial filters and then dive into ICA-based cleaning of EEG data. We will have a short break in between um, so that it's not going too long um, so that you can um, grab a coffee or more that I can grab a coffee in between. Okay, good. So let's get started. EEG and mobile brain body imaging, electroencephalography or mobile brain body imaging. So EEG, you saw that in Valentina's talk already, requires usually attaching several sensors to the head to measure the electrical activity that originates in the brain, in the cortical in the cortex, the neocortex, the outer layer of the brain with a very specific architecture. And it's kind of cumbersome to apply lots of electrodes. You have to use gel, as Valentina already said, so you see that here, me being a subject in one of our experiments. And it's, uh, it takes a lot of time to prepare all that, and you have to prepare these electrodes good so that you have low impedances for good signal quality. This is why you apply gel. Um, and have like very tight fitting caps so that people can actually um, move around a little bit for mobile brain body imaging without having a, a change in impedance because the electrode changes its contact um, with the skin. So and then, as Valentina was talking about, classical EEG research or traditional desktop experiments really require participants to sit in dimly lit rooms, um, to focus on a screen, to um, react according to pre-instructed rules and then um, we sometimes even ask participants not to blink. We take this very high dimensional signal that we have, millions of bits per second that we record with neuroimaging techniques, and then we reduce that to averages. We try to extract the peak of a certain component in that average and then we try to come up with this very reduced high dimensional signal to be able to compare that with one bit of information regarding our responses and that is usually the button press at the end of the trial. And if you are looking at this from the perspective of embodied cognition, what happens in our natural environments, in our habitat, then this is not usually what we're doing. We're not sitting there waiting for things to happen to then respond with a finger press. But we are constantly moving. We change our perception based on our active behavior. And we constantly adapt and fine-tune our motor behaviors to adapt to a dynamically ever-changing environment. So in that sense, mobile brain body imaging tries to leverage EEG and the basics of EEG, but move it outside the lab to now investigate brain dynamics in actively behaving participants to get a little bit closer to what we um, are interested in, that is um, the neural basis of embodied cognition. And one of the other problems that EEG has is that it is usually not considered a brain imaging method, at least not from the community that is working with magnetic resonance imaging, as you can see here, or um, PET. Um, so all these 
very bulky sensors that record brain activity and lying um, participants in the scanner supine not being allowed to move at all because that would change the origin of the signal that you try to localize. Um, this is considered an imaging, <coughs> brain imaging method. However, this community is very conservative in um, saying that EEG would be a brain imaging method. You um, are aware, I'm pretty sure, that um, magnetic resonance imaging has a very low temporal resolution, but an excellent spatial resolution. But the signal is based on hemodynamic changes, so it's a sluggish signal. We're talking about seconds of changes in hemodynamics um, that are necessary to process um, incoming stimuli or prepare responses. And if you look at EEG, basically, the same can be said um, about the temporal resolution. It's excellent. We have no limit in the temporal resolution save our sample rate, but we have a very coarse spatial resolution. Nonetheless, both methods use analytical tools to extract as much information from both the spatial and the temporal domain to allow um, conclusions about what is going on in the brain. And in that sense, I would argue that EEG definitely is a brain imaging method, just like fMRI is. And if you look at the right-hand side of um, this slide, you can see um, an independent composed data set that's from um, Scott McCaig and Julie Orton's um, 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 contribution to the ERP book. Um, you can see that you can localize approximately the origin in the human brain, that you can look into the time course then with very high resolution of different brain areas, and you have many tools to analyze this signal to get to deeper insight of what is going on in the human brain. Taking these brain imaging methods that now allow for example, like ICA, allowed to dissociate brain and non-brain origins to your signal that you record with the EEG, you can transfer that and basically utilize the mobility, the portability of lightweight small EEG amplifiers to now attach them to the subject and let the participants walk around in space, let them act and behave more naturally to get closer to what is going on in the brain um, when we act like we act in our everyday environment. This is a setup for mobile brain body imaging that you can see here that we use in our lab in the Berlin, uh, Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Lab. And um, you can see that we are using EEG um, in this case, but you can use any kind of mobile brain imaging device. This could also be functional near infrared spectroscopy um, or any mobile, hopefully in the near future, optically pumped MEG. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, but if you want to understand how the brain depends on active behavior and or how it controls active behavior, then we have to synchronize brain dynamics with movement, with behavior. And that is what we do here by synchronizing EEG with motion capture. This allows you to find the link between behavior and brain dynamics in both directions. And then to basically still have control about uh, the environment, because um, if you go out into the real world, there will be other pedestrians, there will be cars, there will be things changing in the environment where you have no control over. So what we do, we have like a very large space that is dedicated to people moving around, but we control what they experience in that space by using immersive head-mounted virtual reality. All these data streams will have to be synchronized which is not trivial, but this is nothing we dive into today. Um, and the analysis of these <laughs> combined signals is not trivial um, at all either. So um, there are many problems. And this is a very young field um, that develops um, really um, fast at the moment. So there are um, um, more and more papers coming up with mobile EEG, mobile brain body imaging, imaging approaches, and I'm very happy to see that. So. If we talk about EEG or mobile brain body imaging, which is nothing but utilizing mobile EEG together with other modalities, then um, the neuroanatomical and physiological basis of the signal that we're looking at is the same. However, we will encounter additional signals that are more likely to appear. Because we're measuring electrical activity of the brain, we will measure basically any kind of electrical activity. And you've been listening to the um, first two days of motor 
activity basically you know that muscle contraction produces an electrical signal that can be measured with electrodes your face is full of muscles your neck is full of muscles and when you start moving these muscles will contract your eyes will move more and thus all these activity patterns that you have in more natural behavior will impact the signal of interest that you're recording with your EEG sensors however the underlying cortical architecture as Valentina said is like a perpendicular oriented um, mesh of um, cortical pyramidal neurons um, that synchronize or desynchronize um, thousands, millions of them um, um, in at the same time, basically producing a local field. And they are all directed and oriented orthogonal to the cortex surface, or at least the cortical surface. So with the sulky, it's not always going to be um, orthogonal to the scalp, but it's orthogonal to the neocortex. And here you can see like stained um, pyramidal cells, um, like there are beautiful pictures about um, the cortical architecture. But the general idea here is if you look at these pyramidal cells, these are basically innovated mostly or one way to, to inhibit or excite these kind of cortical neurons is a thalamic projection. Basically all your sensory information, say the olfactory system, goes through the thalamus and then into the specific sensory, primary sensory areas where you find these cortical cells. And now the thalamus um, inputs, excites or inhibits these um, neurons and millions of them will basically be synchronized, um, excited or inhibited. And that produces this kind of electric field that Valentina already showed. You can mimic this using a dipole. That's a physical approximation of the electrical fields that um, distribute in the cortex. And this allows you to mathematically model where in the brain these kind of activities that you measure on the outside of the skull um, originate. So this is the physiological basis. So we're looking at postsynaptic potentials, no action potentials, but really large numbers of um, synchronized pyramidal neurons that get excited or inhibited at the same time. And then <clears throat> I start moving into spatial filters. So because we have topographic information when we measure with different electrodes all over the scalp, the brain itself or these recordings are a spatial filter. We have different activity patterns um, at different locations. And this depends, already um, said before, on the reference location and what you reference, but the principle is always the same. You can see that electrodes, and I hope you can see my mouse, that electrodes that are located very close to the excited or inhibited um, batch of neurons show um, um, a very strong signal. You can see that here in a very strong amplitude. And the further away you go from the origin of activity in the cortex, the smaller this signal becomes. So you have a decrease in amplitude. And with that you have increased and decreased amplitudes for specific potentials or um, time uh, activity over time at different locations and that in itself is a spatial filter that tells us a little bit of where in the brain what is going on. Here in this case it's a radial dipole because it's perpendicular to the skull. Um, there are different forms of dipoles. You can have a tangential dipole um, like shown in this case and if you had an electrode located directly over the midpoint of this batch of neurons being active, this would show actually no activity at all. Because you have one pole that is inhibited here in the um, um, dendrites of these pyramidal cells, and there you can see like this strong negative um, activation of your electrode. But at the opposite um, side of these batch of neurons, you will have a um, positive polarity of that same potential. And since your brain is a huge volume conductor, um, you will have sometimes opposite potentials at opposite sides of the skull if you have like a very strong dipolar source being active at any given time. And you then of course can also have um, oblique um, dipole orientations a mixture of the radial and um, the tangential dipole that will change the pattern again and with all that combined you can see that there is like spatial filtering going on the moment that you record your signal. 
And here you can see the combination of both ideas that's nicely described in the Jackson and Bolger um, paper in 2014 in Psychophysiology. Look into this paper, very useful information about um, the standards of EEG recordings. Then you see that there is uh, a clear distribution of polarity and amplitude changes dependent on the location or the origin of the electrical activity. Okay, so that's the main idea. And we were already talking about spatial filtering. So if you look at the human skull, our brain inside the skull and separated from the electrode by different um, um, layers of a non-conductive material, basically. So if you zoom in this small area that we're looking at here, you see that there are different um, 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 structures that prohibit the signal. The signal would be originating here in the dark shaded areas of our cortex. And then it has to pass through all these structures that are not really friendly for electrical current to be passed through, right? So within the cortex, this is all volume conduction. The signal will distribute as if there was nearly no resistance. But then it basically comes to the arachnoid matter and all the other, other matters, and then it's going to, to um, um, come um, towards the skull, and then there's the skin, and then there's hair. So all these structures basically do not allow volume conduction, but this is capacitive conduction at that point. So if you look in the brain itself, this is all volume conduction, and this is a linear mixture of all sources being active at the same time in the volume of our brain. Then they come to these structures that have like a higher um, resistance towards the distribution of these electrical currents. And these are simply capacitive conduction um, um, processes that take place. And those basically move up to the electrode, then shift basically the positive and negative ions that you have in your electrolyte and then the coating of your electrode. And that is a signal that you are going to record at the end of the day. So, Talking about these structures, the point is that within the volume, you will have different sources being active at all time, and they will mix in a linear fashion due to volume conduction. And then there will be a very strong filter process taking place of these um, um, electrical currents now passing through capacitive conduction towards your electrode and that will smear the signal off. It will basically suppress very high frequency. It's, it's a low pass filter, basically, um, if you look at these conductivity um, factors of the skull, of the skin and the other um, um, structures. Okay, so we have a smearing, we have volume conduction and a smearing um, that makes it pretty difficult to estimate where in the brain these um, activity patterns originate. But there are mathematical tools to, to approximate that and um, this is, um, ICA is one of those. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is an example. This is like a simulation of volume conduction. This is um, a video that um, Zeynep Akalinak Cha produced together with Scott. Um, and you see here um, a simulation of a real brain, a realistic head model, the brain model here, that's a forward model. And um, you see two sources being simulated. Um, on this one, you don't see the second one. Well, if you concentrate on this source here, basically you can see that this is a slowed down version of an alpha rhythm. Oh, I see the other one here. It's a, um, in the right parietal cortex and the left motor cortex, there are two alpha oscillators with different frequencies that slow down so that we can see what happens. So this is a forward model and this is as if we knew ground truth, where in the brain, what exactly happens. If you now take that forward model um, and include the skull and the skin and basically project back from these sources to the surface of the skull, where our electrodes are located, then this is what you would see. And what you see here is that, first of all, every single source um, that is active mixes in a linear fashion. You can't differentiate on the surface by, by naked eye which source contributed what to the surface pattern that we measure. That's the first point. The second point is that even if you have a source that is located parietally or in the motor cortex, like relatively posterior areas, then you can see that this kind of activity pattern can still be measured or parts of that activity can be measured at lo uh, um, electrodes located very distant from the origin of the activity. So again, there is a spatial filter, 
because the activity patterns change, decrease, and depend on the orientation of the dipoles. Um, but you will measure activity of any active source being um, active in parallel at any place on um, the skull. In that sense, as Valentina said, um, the reference the, is not inactive. The reference will always be active, but as long as you know what your reference is, you can mathematically reconstruct that. So, and then comes <coughs> spatial filtering, ICA, independent component analysis, as introduced by Bell and Sanofsky, and then adapted by Scott McKay to EEG and MEG data later, um, is a blind source separation method that um, dissociates basically the data that we record on the skull. That's what you have here. <coughs> so you see your matrix of channel times time. This is your recorded EEG data. And what we are trying to find is an unmixing matrix that basically dissociates all these signals recorded on the sensor level into independent components. Basically, <coughs> sorry, basically the components that you saw here. So if we assume we know where in the brain the activity takes place, then we can basically compute by back projecting these to the surface the activity that we should expect on the sensor level. Now using ICA, we just do it the inverse way, right? We have the sensor level and now we're trying to decompose the data into these independent sources. ICA, like any other model, comes with a lot of assumptions. Some of them are more critical as others. For example, non-stationarity of the signal. But basically, um, it works pretty well. Okay, good. So, and this is ICA, basically decomposes the sensor data into ICA activations. So you get <clears throat> as many independent components as you have sensors. And you have the same sample rate, you have the same time um, um, of recording basically being um, reflected in the activation of the ICs. And then basically with that, and that is a spatial filter approach here, you get um, spatial filters. These are stationary spatial filters. They won't change over the entire time course of your experiment. Um, and you see that in these filters you have different distributions, different weights basically, how much each IC contributes to um, each of the sensors. And these are the IC scalp maps. So now that you have the inverse, um, the unmixing matrix basically, you can multiply your ICA activation time course with the scalp maps and you will get back to your sensor signal. This is what ICA does in a nutshell. And having this kind of um, these two matrices, you can now also focus on specific aspects. Or, as Valentina said, you can simply remove specific ICs from the data matrix and then back project. And with that, you could eliminate, for example, eye movement related activity. Okay. And this is the point. Um, basically where we focus on today. Um, we're looking into ICA-based cleaning. <clears throat> As I said, ICA gives you um, several dimensions for each independent component and this is basically described in the independent component properties. As you already saw, you will get the spatial filter for your IC, that is the scalp map. And again, this simply reflects how much each independent component, the activity somewhere in the brain or outside the brain, contributes to the signal that you record at the, or contributes to each of the sensors. Then you will get the time course of that IC. And there are additional information because once you have this beautiful dipolar pattern on the scalp, if an independent component is maximally independent and thus shares um, less mutual information with other ICs, the more dipolar the pattern becomes. And that was beautifully uh, shown um, in a paper by Arnaud Delorme um, and colleagues. Um, so using this dipolar pattern on the scalp, you can simply use a mathematical model, an equivalent dipole model, to reconstruct that origin. 
So ICA doesn't come with a location in, in the brain, it comes with a scalp map, but if the scalp map is dipolar, you can simply use that scalp map to reconstruct the sources in the brain using equivalent dipole modeling. So that's super convenient, very few assumptions only, and with those few assumptions you get additional information about the anatomical origin of the activity that you measure on the surface. And then, of course, you can have additional computations on the IC time course. For example, you can transform time course into frequency domain and you will get the spectrum. You can see that here. And you can simply look into the data, chop it up in, in time, just compare different stretches of data to see whether there is any systematic pattern in this data. And one recent tool that was added to the mix is IC Label, basically giving you a probability based on different dimensions of these ICs of what this IC, what kind of process this IC most probably represents. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Okay, I will now dive into the different aspects, looking into the scalp map, how the scalp map basically um, um, comes out of ICA and what it tells you when you look at that. Then looking at IC label, the different probabilities, the classes that you can classify um, these ICs um, to, like brain, muscle, eye, others, line noise, whatever you have. And then you will have the time course. Um, this is very informative because you can compare that directly as it is synced with your EEG sensor pattern. You can compare it with your sensor data and you will see which IC contributes to what activity pattern in your sensor data. So that is very useful sometimes to simply have a look of what's going on in different ICs over different time courses and how that relates to the sensor data. <clears throat> then if you look into the continuous data, this is nothing but stacked color-coded amplitude over time. So just imagine you have like an ongoing EEG, you cut out a certain aspect of that EEG and then you have positive values being color-coded red. The more positive, the more um, saturated the red becomes. Negative values and amplitude become blue-ish and bluer, 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 the more negative they are. And so you basically just color-code each sample um, according to its amplitude and then you have a color-coded time series that you stack on top of each other. If there is an event-related activity, you will see color bands basically appearing, reflecting. It's a different form of visualizing event-related activity, actually. And you will see some examples later. And then you will have um, the dipole location using equivalent dipole modeling. You can now come up with an approximation of where this IC pattern, the scalp map, basically your spatial filter, um, originates in the brain. And this is, of course, very useful because it gives you additional anatomical information. So now we are now certainly able to talk about, oh, there's activity most likely originating in parietal cortex or in occipital cortex or the Bereitschaftspotential that we're looking at uh, in the previous talk might be originating in motor cortex or premotor cortex. So this adds additional information that can be used to get a better understanding on, um, of the data and how it relates to cognitive function. And then in the end, of course, if you use time domain information and you use Fourier transform or wavelet, whatever, um, you can basically transform that into the frequency domain and you get additional information. For example, in which frequency band is the strongest activity visible in this component? And this helps you over time to dissociate what is brain and what is non-brain activity. We've seen in the previous days that muscle activity um, works in a very high frequency range. Due to the overlap of the motor unit potentials, you have a very high frequency activity that you measure in EMG activity, and that usually shows up in these kinds of um, power spectral pictures that I show you later also, um, with a very broadband high power frequency distribution. And this is a clear indicator that this might not be brain. But be careful, um, it might not be as easy as it looks um, or sounds at this point. So, we're going to go through these different dimensions and I'm going to give you a few ideas and our perspective in Berlin, or more specifically my perspective um, in Berlin, um, how to interpret these results. So this is um, the IC 
properties scalp map function. If you use the topoplot function in MATLAB, EG lab, you can plot all these different topographies. So in this case, we plotted 40 topographies. Um, and it depends on the number of channels. So you get as many ICs and thus as many scalp maps as channels that you put into um, the decomposition. If you have noisy channels that you interpolate because you remove them um, after being detected as noisy, you reduce the rank of the data. So you still have 60 channels, but if you interpolated two of them, you will get only 58 IC components because there is no additional information contained in these two channels as they were interpolated based on neighboring channel activity. No um, 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 information in itself that was carried in these channels. And what you can see here is that these ICs are usually sorted according to the explained variance in the sensor signal. So this is energy sorting basically. And here you can already see that among the first 10 components or so, usually what you will find is eye movement activity. And you can see that here in IC4 and IC1, one is a vertical eye movement, um, and I'm going to explain you why this is the case later. And this is horizontal eye movement. Um, and you can see that after some time with experience, you know that the distribution of the scalp, um, of these scalp maps, tells you a little bit where the origin of this um, distribution pattern is. And um, for the vertical eye movement, that's obviously a very high weighting of the activity that you measure. Um, um, at the sensors for this IC very frontally located. But it's only one pole that you can see that's covering the entire forehead, basically. Um, if you compare that to the horizontal eye movements, this is a clear dipolar pattern. You can see a positive and a negative pole. And obviously, I'm going to show that later. If you have two eyes in your head, these are two huge batteries with a ne negative resting state potential in the retina. If you move these two batteries, your negative pole moves to one side, making the right side negative and the left side that is non-charged, your cornea, positive. So whenever you move your eyes, this polarity pattern will change. In the spatial filter that you see here, in the um, decomposition, that won't change the stationary filter. Um, polarity is arbitrary. Okay, so and then you see tons of other components here. Um, and um, some of them are brain, like the 11 um, IC3. Some of them are muscles. And you can clearly see that, um, I explain that now based on the distribution of the isopotential lines that you can see. The isopotential lines are these black lines here um, that have the same potential. That's why they're called isopotential. Um, and you can see that there's a, a radial di dipole because you have only one clear polarity pattern that distributes over the skull. If it was a tangential dipole, you would have like two opposing polarities being visible. For oblique dipoles, this is going to be shifted a little bit in between the two versions. So the question here is where would the potential origin of um, that distribution um, be uh, located? And what you can see here is that on the upper row, um, you can see that there's activity in your cortical column. And this can be modeled with the dipole, as I've been um, um, telling you um, before. And the closer this is to the surface of the head, the more dense the isopotential lines become. Um, and for an oblique current, this shifts a little bit. And you can see that um, from the radial distribution here, it shifts towards a bipolar distribution. You can already start seeing the opposite polarity here. And if you now have a tangential current, what you can see is that you have a clear dipolar pattern. Okay? The isopotential lines and the distance between the two maximum polarities depend on the depth of the dipole. The distribution itself depends on the dipole moment. So that is the orientation. And so there is obviously a clear overlap between the information that you can get from a scalp map and the information that you can get from the dipole model. Obviously, as the dipole model is based on the scalp map. So, And here you can see a prototypical motor cortex or sensory motor cortex scalp map. 
which is a tangential um, component. Most of the cases that's based on the anatomy of our motor cortex, sensory motor cortices, um, um, the central sulcus um, area. Um, and what you can see is that the isopotential lines are not very close together. Um, and if you look at this dipole, you see that it's um, very um, close to the surface, so it's a relative close isopotential line and the two um, um, opposite pot uh, potentials, uh, poles. If you move the dipole deeper, this is what you see here in this case, you see that the poles move further apart. So basically, if you have a hat model and volume conduction in that hat model, any dipole that is located close to the surface will create two opposing poles or very dense isopotential lines close to the surface. And the deeper you move that dipole, the bigger these isopotential line distances become. If it's a radial um, dipole, if it's a tangential dipole, the further apart the two opposite poles become, the deeper you move because the signal will have to spread. Okay, this is the idea about the scalp map and the redundant information that you find in the scalp map and the um, dipole model. So this is what you see here, basically, right? It's more or less um, um, a similar um, um, location when it comes to the sagittal and the horizontal um, slice. You can see here, it's like occipital cortex in this case, um, but pretty deep, um, as you can see here on the z-axis. It's deeper than this guy here, and also a little bit further inside, more medial. But the point here is moving down in the brain, that worked well, um, produces um, further moving away of the two opposite polarities. Okay, so these are the scalp maps. If you look at the IC activity, then you see that there's tons of information in this. It's like a sensor um, activation time course, right? But now it is based on a maximally independent component. And if you look, for example, at IC1, the example that I just showed you before, the vertical IC, then you see that this independent component reflects perfectly blink activity that you also see in your sensors. In the sensors, you would see that across all sensors that are located frontally and then with less amplitude, the more posterior you move in the sensor space. This is all covered by the IC, basically showing that the frontal electrodes that are close to the eyes have a lot of energy in this for this IC scalp map and the further you move away, the less energy these sensors contribute to this IC. So this is why you have this patch of red, strong energy right at your forehead. And this is a time course. So if you compare um, this to the horizontal eye movement, you can see that this is an uh, a entirely different time course. And the behavior here is more like a rectangular signal that you can see here. And this is the saccade. This is a rapid eye movement to one side and moving back. So you move to one side and it becomes like strong, a very fast movement here. And then it stays on that side and then it moves back. These movement parts here are very high frequency, very rapid. And then you stay, you move again, you look to a different location, and this is like this rectangular pattern that you usually have in an EOG if you place your electrodes to the left and to the right of the eyes. So this is reflected in IC activity. Now, I said um, this is um, a brain component, IC22. We've been talking about that. And here you can see this um, beautiful alpha activity. I'm, I'm a huge fan of alpha activity. And um, it is functional in the sense, and it is one of the dimensions that really helps you to dissociate brain from non-brain activity. And if you look at the sensor space now, and this is shown in the upper picture, then you can see a standard EEG recording. This is a stationary traditional desktop protocol. And what you can see is that people move their eyes because that is what we naturally do. Um, and eye blinks are related to cognitive function. Um, with increasing mental load, you have an increase or decrease in eye blinks. You, you see usually that participants, if they know the relative structure of your experimental protocol, they will not blink when they know that an event will come up because they want to take up the information, right? So you suppress blinking because you rely on visual input. And once that information was given, you can blink. So that is usually why you see blinks after events in these standard protocols. And down here, 
What you can see is the IC activation pattern. IC1, that was the one that was reflecting the blinks, right? So, and what you can see is these are time aligned. You can see clearly in the EEG data that whenever there is a blink going on in the sensor space, that this component reflects this blink activity beautifully. Very nice. And what I'm doing now here is I'm just using channel data. This is FP1 and this is IC1. Scaling um, is arbitrary here. I see amplitude has no meaning in that sense. But what you can see in red is the activation time course of the vertical IC. And it fits perfectly the blink that you see in the EEG pattern. And if you now overlay that with the IC4, the um, um, horizontal EOG, you can see that whenever there's strong movement in the eyes to the sides, that that part is very well explained by the green IC time course here. So this is what I'm saying when I talk about use your IC activation time course to look and compare that to your EEG sensor data. You will see how much each of the ICs contribute to your sensor data. And in the case of eye movement, that is pretty obvious. For others, this might, be, this might be not that clear, but it's still helpful. Okay, the second dimension that you can use to decide whether you want to remove an independent component from your decomposition before projecting back and clean up your data is the power spectrum. And the power spectrum usually for brain components shows a very strong peak in the 10 hertz um, frequency range. And then what you also observe in most of the components is the classical 1 over F decrease in power. So with increasing frequency, you get a decreasing power. That's called the 1 over F function. And you see that in most of the components, um, save a few. Um, this is the prototypical um, motor mu activity that we see in this um, scalp map that I showed you, the motor um, um, scalp map. Um, so there is usually a strong 10 hertz and the first harmonic frequency band. In this participant, this is clearly shifted to a slightly lower frequency. So the peak frequency is somewhere around 8 hertz in this participant. And you might know or have read the Klimisch paper about individual alpha peak. Um, shifts, so there's huge differences between individuals and their peak in, in the alpha frequency range. So if you want to have like a very um, concentrated analysis on alpha activity, you should always determine the individual alpha peak before then adjusting the neighboring bands. And if you have an 8 hertz peak um, in alpha, then the first harmonic would not be 20, of course, but 16 hertz. So this is what you see here. Um, this is a very nice sensory motor component. Um, that we often observe in these kind of experiments. This is IC1, this is our vertical eye movement. Very steep 1 over F decrease here, and then it just stays um, on the same level. There's no power change anymore, and that's more or less the same for the horizontal IC. That's IC4 that I've showed before. Okay, and then this is what I um, talked about before in the frequency domain. This is a muscle component. Um, it's IC9, um, and I um, might come back to that. What you see here is the prototypical muscle activity that has very broadband high frequency power. You don't see 1 over F here. There's no decrease in power with increasing frequency, but it actually ramps up around usually 20 hertz and then just stays there. So it ramps up 15 to 20 hertz and then it stays on this level. But in this component, this is a Mobi component actually, um, you see like an additional 10 hertz peak or close to 10 hertz. This is something that bothers us for some time now. We still have no clear explanation of what that actually is, but this 10 hertz is not indicative of a muscle actually, but would be indicative of more cortical origin. This is a very prototypical power, uh, power spe uh, spectrum for a muscle. And that's what I said. It ramps up around 15 to 20 hertz and then just stays there. There's no one over F decrease. Okay. And then we come to dipole location. And as I said before, this is very helpful in estimating where in the brain the um, activity originates um, because that gives us additional anatomical location. So if you see a dipole located in this area, so this very much post uh, central gyrus here, so sensory motor area most likely with an approximation. So we have to be careful, right? This is an estimate. 
It's a model-based reconstruction of the origin based on the scalp map. So there are model assumptions and we simply don't know ground truth. It's an ill posed problem mathematically and there are infinite solutions to this problem. Without model assumptions, we can't reconstruct anything. But giving the assumptions and knowing what you're doing, you have an estimate, an approximation of where this dipole might be located. So usually we argue that the dipole is located in or near a certain cortical structure. We never use the exact coordinates that we get because, as I said, there is noise in this um, um, process. Nonetheless, you get an approximate anatomical location and with that you get anatomical function. And that helps you to explain why this component might act or the um, activity pattern that you see um, looks the way it does. So this is a simple um, field trip toolbox that's integrated in eGLab. That's also a free toolbox in, for MATLAB for using um, these dipole modeling um, approaches. And what you get is like for every single IC you get a dipole. Um, with the location and the moment. These are standardized here. And you can, with that, basically extract the exact coordinates, MNI or Talairach, uh, whatever coordinate system is used. And you can then use um, clients on um, the internet or like downloadable apps um, where you can simply add your um, XYZ coordinates that you get from the dipole location and basically enter that to simply retrieve where in the brain this dipole is located to. Um, so this is very straightforward and this, in, in, in my perspective, puts EEG clearly up um, as an imaging method. We're not talking about sensor space only anymore. We're talking about independent activity that can be localized to specific brain regions. And that is um, um, the same information, basically, with some restrictions that we get from other imaging methods. Looking into the continuous data, um, you can see that in this case, this is a MOBI experiment. So mobile brain body imaging, that was a dual task um, um, walk experiment. And um, what the IC um, property continuous data does is simply it goes through the ongoing original raw data set and it chops out apex of same length, um, equivalently or um, um, evenly distributed across the entire time series, and then color codes that and stacks them on top of each other. As I said, you can see here these blobs of red and blue. These are simply amplitudes color coded according to positive uh, and negativity. And then you use the first trial that would be down here, the very first line, and then you have a second trial stacked on top of that, and a third, and so forth. And then you use a Gaussian filter basically moving vertically up to smooth the picture a little bit. Um, but what you see here, obviously, is that there are like two main parts of this experiment. And the first block was where the subject was walking, and the second block was where the participant was standing. And you can clearly see that the activation pattern of this IC reflects the functional state. That can be a mechanical artifact, that can be physiological activity, that can be anything we don't know yet. So we have to find all the different dimensions to come to a conclusion what that most likely indicates, but it clearly differentiates between experimental conditions. And you can do the same thing on APECT data. So as Valentina already showed, you have events in your data structure, right? So if you APEC your data around this event from minus 200 to 1000 or whatever you take, and you then color code that and stack it on top of each other, then patterns emerge. Because if you have an event-related potential, and this is nothing other than an event-related potential that you can see here, but it's not averaged. It's just like sorted according to trial. And if you computed these values as one trace average, you would see like a positivity here, a negativity here, and then a stronger positivity here that is smeared. So this would be like kind of a P1, N1, and then a P3-ish complex that you can see. So this is a lot of information that you can see here. And then having all these information, um, we can use IC label. It's a trained classifier to classify the ICs that we get from a decomposition. So the idea here is simply that you as um, a novice or an expert, whoever you are, um, 
get support in selecting ICs that might reflect artifactual activity, that might reflect activity that you're not interested in and that you want to remove from your signal based on an objective algorithm without subjective prior that you have. And this is a very good thing to do because it you know, makes your analysis pipeline more objective. I have nothing against like manually selecting even time domain cleaning your data manually. You can do all that. You can remove whatever you want to remove. And that will certainly be biased if you do that subjectively. Um, and it is no problem as long as this is protocoled and you basically open your protocol to everyone to reanalyze the data. So as long as you publish which time points were removed for every single subject, that's fine because it's replicable. Um, but you can save time and move to a more objective standardized approach that might be better comparable across labs, then an automated um, approach is nice and IC label is one of these approaches. So basically um, Luca um, Pioni, uh, Pionacci was working on that with the Swartz Center group and they created like a huge database and um, had expert rating certain um, ICs and a huge community labeling these ICs and they came up with certain classes if you're interested in that. You can look this up. Um, there's a nice tutorial and there's a chance to label ICs um, on the website. You will find the um, links in the slides when we're published. And this classifier, basically it's a trained classifier as I said, so experts were labeling and then the machine learning approach in the background used those labels of the experts and the community differently weighted um, to come up with an automatic classification of ICs based on all the dimensions that you can get. Usually it's um, in the light version, it's the frequency, the power spectrum um, and the scalp topography and you can add also the dipole location to that. And then IC label gives you um, different classes with a specific probability for this case, it would say this component is likely with a, a likelihood of 45% uh, um, a brain component, but there are also other probabilities that it might be a heart, very low probability, 6%, but it might also be channel noise, 26% likelihood, and could be something other, 18% likelihood. Other is like everything that nobody knows what it is. And IC label provides these kind of probabilities that a specific IC belongs to a certain class, and that um, um, usually um, is the case that one IC belongs to several classes. It's not always that clear. And this allows you for thresholding or using combination of probabilities. You could say I can um, keep all components that are labeled with at least 50% probability to be a brain component. That would be one approach. Or um, you take a winner takes it all um, decision criteria. It's up to you. It's only that you have to communicate what you did and why you did it. And then one of the issues is that IC label was mainly trained on stationary data sets because um, this is an issue if you have very clean IC decomposition because the data is very clean, your IC a decomposition usually looks way better. So this might be a problem um, for using IC label for mobile brain body imaging experiments. And thus we started a new um, 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 label project that's IC Mobi, that's headed by Noel um, Jacobson from the University of Florida, Dan Ferris lab, together with um, our lab. And if you're interested in that, you're invited to share your data if you have Mobi data with certain criteria. And if you're interested in labeling um, ICs, um, please join us. Um, it's a community effort. I'm much appreciated if we can push that forward. So. With that, basically, you come to the IC label classes. And before we go through these, brain, muscle, eye, heart, line noise, channel noise, and other, um, I suggest we have a short break so that you can get a coffee. Most importantly, that I can get a coffee and drink something. And I see you in five. OK, thank you. OK, welcome back. Uh, I hope you all enjoy your coffee. And we will go on with IC label and classes. So I start with this quote, um, one person's noise is another person's data. I quote it as a famous person quote, so if you try to search the origin of that um, phrase, um, let me know. There are several potential origins and it might um, have come from like one person's food is another uh, man's poison. 
um, or one man's noise is another man's music. Um, that developed over time into this one person's noise is another person's data. For Moby community, definitely um, a very um, fitting quote. So some person's noise, another person's functional Moby data in my sense. I would not argue that eye movement and muscle activity are artifacts. Um, so eye movements are part of the cognitive system. Eye movements are very systematic, belong and are there to solve cognitive tasks basically and so are muscles. From an embodied perspective, um, the mind and the, the body cannot be dissociated. They're two parts of the same coin, two sides of the same coin. So eye movement obviously tells tell us something about the cognitive state or the goal of um, what people are doing. Uh, this is the case for vertical as well as for horizontal eye movement blinks. Um, movements are functional. Muscle activity, for example, neck muscle activity, is functional in the sense that you orient towards a stimulus of interest and the high density of muscles, like 2 times 13 muscles, I think, in the dorsal neck only, um, allow you to coat the orientation of your head in space. Um, so a given um, set of muscles that contract um, with a given strength would coat a specific location if you're in one space, for example. That's a high dimensional space um, that you can use for coding of um, um, position, for example. Gate-related activity obviously tells us something if it's not a um, mechanical artifact, but even then it tells us something about the gate cycle. So in that sense, um, it is useful um, to use that kind of information, for example, to compute artifact templates. And noisy channels obviously are other classes um, that are usually considered um, artifacts. I also consider noisy channels artifact. Um, mechanical artifacts are artifacts for me. Um, but when talking about muscle activity and eye movement, I would argue that this is not artifactual activity. So, non-brain activity, I'm going to rush a little bit through these um, um, next slides to just make the point here of how you can um, recognize certain aspects in the ICD composition. And vertical eye movements are clearly um, recognizable by these huge voltages that go along with blinks. There are several factors that contribute to that. There are a few nice papers um, um, that um, explain why that is the case. One of the um, factors is that if you close the lid, then you change the electrical field properties of the forehead. That leads to a large increase. You have eyeball movements um, um, up and down that contribute to these kind of vertical um, blink-related activity patterns. And um, you can see that clearly in the IC activation time course that overlaps with the ascent data. And for horizontal eye movement, I already showed you that these are like the kind of saccade activities, very high frequency, more or less rectangular signals that you can get from an ICA if you have covered um, the, um, um, the most of your head's, uh, volume. So for the vertical eye movement, you see the distribution, frontally distributed, very high energy in the frontal sensors. You have very clear um, high amplitudes that go along with blinks. You have a very steep 1 over F decrease in the low frequency range. And you have usually a um, dipole located near the eyes. Um, remember, there is no forward model that includes the eyes currently. So the eyes are not part of the model when you reconstruct this kind of dipole. Um, so sometimes it ends up in the brain, which might be confusing. So um, we are working on a model that includes neck muscle and eyes um, for the forward model solution. And um, this will be published hopefully soon. So and then, of course, um, for the time course, um, you can see very strong activity patterns. These, if it's a blink, you have a very strong positivity and then falling back immediately to a negative value. And these are these very strong pronounced activity patterns here. So scalp map, deep frontal dipole, um, I see activation, clear blink peaks, um, continuous data shows um, large Y range um, changes over time. Dipole location is in or near the eyes usually and the frequency spectrum is a very steep one over F in the low frequency range. That would be a clear vertical eye movement and a clear horizontal eye movement. Um, you again see 
The scalp map with a deep frontal dipole, uh, strong positive and negative poles outside the scalp, close to the eyes. This is the pattern that you can see on the scalp map. The dipole again is located in or near the eyes. You have a clear rectangular pattern for saccades. Um, if you're not sure whether that's eye movement, just compare that to your sensor data, you can see that. And a clear, steep um, decrease, 1 over f here. Um, only in the low frequency range and then it's plateauing off. Okay. So this is what you see for these ICs. And as a side note now, this is where IC has been used traditionally, also in ERP, traditional desktop experiments, to remove eye movement artifacts. Um, and this is perfectly fine because ICA usually does a very good job in decomposing eye components. So if you are interested in only using ICA to remove ICs that reflect eye movement, um, you're most of the time perfectly fine with that. Identify those, delete them from the matrix, back project, and you get a clean, without eye movement, um, data set. So this is a very good um, decomposition method. Another um, example of traditionally considered artifacts is muscle activity. And we can't not have muscle activity, even if we try to. Um, relax. And again, muscle activity might be indicative of cognitive state. If you're concentrating, if you're, you know, um, raising your eyebrows because you're surprised, things like that are an expression of, you know, um, cognitive state, affective state that is associated with muscular contraction. And these muscle contractions will be recorded in your EEG signal. I was talking about the neck muscle system. You see this high dimensional system of neck muscles that are there to move and stabilize your head in space. Um, this is functional information that we can get and analyze using ICA on EEG data. And I'm not going into the details of the EMG recordings here. Um, we are certainly not um, in place to be able to record optimal EMG activity with EEG signals. And I mind you to consider that having EMG electrodes on the neck while you rotate your head might lead to movement of the muscle underneath the electrodes, which would be one problem for ICA as it assumes stationary sources. By that you definitely introduce non-stationarity in the signal and that might be also a problem for the decomposition. So, what would that look like? Muscle ICs come in different <laughs> shapes and forms. And um, usually what you see, it's a very superficial scalp topography. So it's very far outside the map that you have here, defined by your sensors. And um, if it's like a radial source that you can see here, um, it's very uh, likely to be localized pretty deep. This could be the sternocleidomastoid muscle, for example, that's attached to the mastoid process and to your collarbone, basically, and that's like the inward rotation of your head. That's a sternocleidomastoid. Any kind of rotation of the head is um, going to be uh, coming with activity of this muscle. So um, what you see here is a nice muscle spectrum. Um, it's um, ramping up, staying on plateau like about 20 hertz and higher. So this is high broad frequency power that you see in these muscles. And the location is uh, pretty mm, approximate, I would say. And again, muscles are not part of your head model when you reconstruct sources. So you usually have superficial dipoles. Um, you have clear high frequency activity and, and the continuous data pattern you have like um, strong large amplitude fluctuations here. You can see that um, that might be um, some movement in a break or something for example where participants um, started moving the head. This is another example, um, not as clear. The dipole location is pretty deep. The scalp map again is kind of a radial um, source. Um, and you don't see much in the continuous data. So this is very, very deep. Um, this is not the sternocleido, um, definitely one of the deeper dorsal neck muscles, if it is a muscle. Um, but you can see in the time um, um, uh, scrolling activity here of the ICA, you can see that there's very high frequency, large amplitude changes, um, which is really interesting. This component, by the way, was labeled as brain with a very high likelihood. Um, Okay, and this is um, gait-related activity. I, just a very 
brief ex excursion here because gate related activity is something that we were really interested in here in the twin brain project right so we're looking into how supraspinal control processes interact with gait itself how gait as a primary task influences cognition and the underlying neural dynamics when you have to do a secondary task when you walk and you type in your phone that's a secondary task that requires visual resources that can be used to look in front of you to basically plan your gait um, the trajectory or where you're walking things like that um, are not well investigated um, there are over the last um, last decade basically we started really um, ramping up the number of studies on treadmills but also natural overground walking but also in the real world um, looking into gait and how gait impacts neural dynamics and additional cognitive tasks so when you have gait then you have movement of the head in three dimensions. You have movement of the eyes. So you walk basically, when you walk, you move your head up and down. You sway to the left and to the right and back and forth. And why you are looking at certain aspects of the environment, you have to stabilize your head. The biggest portion of that is going to be produced by stabilizing um, the outside world with eye movements, but additional neck muscle activity will be in place. In addition to that, you will have more artifactual activity, really like mechanical artifacts of cable sway pulling on the electrodes, leading to micro movement, which might come with changes in impedance, large amplitude um, artifacts that you get in there. And so um, the question is, how can you address these kind of gate related artifacts? And there are a few groups working on that. For example, the Oldenburg group here uh, um, showing that you are able to extract relevant information from decomposed data and also other approaches to basically show what gate related activity patterns in IC decompositions would look like. And you can see here one example um, and we don't really know what that is. It doesn't look like physiological activity, right? It looks more likely to be mechanical artifact, cable sway or something related, pressure on electrodes. But what you see clearly here is that you have a very systematic pattern over time in the scrolling activity here, right? That is indicative of the gait cycle. If you have additional information like IMUs or other kind of motion capture approaches, then you can overlay that and you could potentially extract gait related information from artifacts that you record in the EG. And that's a very powerful approach. In some of our studies we saw that these kind of patterns are usually um, located close to CZ or uh, the periphery of CZ, FCZ. Um, you can see that here it's a little bit more distributed in this case. You see here again in the continuous data that the first block was a walking block, the second wasn't. So you can see that that differentiates um, between walking and standing. And um, this is going to be um, labeled by IC label as other because it's a non-functional and obviously also not a recurrent um, issue for stationary desktop experiments. So the IC activation usually is like very low uh, frequency, uh, approximately one hertz. Depends on the gate cycle, obviously. So the faster you walk, the higher the frequency and harmonics. Um, so the best information that you can extract here is um, the scrolling of IC activity. Here's another one um, that is not that clear, um, but basically the distribution is also um, frontally, frontal centrally, um, and um, it shows the differentiation between the blocks. Dipole location is very uh, frontal, and you see um, strong power in the low frequency range. Sometimes you have like this zigzag pattern here um, that comes um, with these kind of um, IC um, components. So, and now, um, I come to the conclusion of this talk. So the question of how much of this ICA decomposition do we want to remove? And this is a critical question. It's a crucial question, obviously, because you will alter the data. You will mix um, different components. If you remove certain aspects of the data, the signal will look different. And as I said um, previously, um, ICA was introduced to the traditional ERP community as a very good approach um, to clean EEG data from eye movements, replacing basically the Gretman calls the, the linear um, regression approaches because they um, often came with um, some difficulties of over or under cleaning. 
um, the data and ICA proved to be a very good tool to get rid of eye movements and this kind of approach of identifying using your data cleaning it running ICA identifying eye movement components remove that was a very good approach for the ERP community so it has since then been established as a standard in cleaning your data. I, most of the groups I know usually run ICA and the first step after ICA decomposition is to identify eye movements and get rid of eye movements in the data. And I would simply ask myself if I have the decomposition and I know that I can basically not look at eye movements but simply ignore the ICs, um, but why would I not make use of that information if I do have it. So my question really is why would you remove eye movement in that sense? I mean I understand for ERP you can do that and back project and run your ERP but you could also analyze eye movements, right? There's an additional dimension of information that gives you more insight into of what is going on. And if you then start to remove eye components, why would you not go on and remove muscle components. If you're not interested in eyes, you're not interested in muscle activity, why would you not go on and remove muscle? And why would you not go even further? Why would you not like remove all artifactual data that you think is artifactual? In the end you just invert the question and ask why don't you just keep brain? Remove everything but brain ICs. And this is what I'm going to show you now. Um, this is your data. This is like an event related potential. This is mental rotation, unclean data, classical traditional desktop experiment. Super nice. Um, you have a very strong EOG activity pattern here and I hope you can see the traces. They're kind of slim. It's going to be better soon. So this is a parietal occipital um, central midline um, and you see a very nice P1N1, P2-ish and a P3 complex. This is a classical visual evoked um, component that you see here or component sequence in the ERP, right? So it looks super nice. Here we have our IC decomposition on that mental rotation data set. You see clear eye movement um, components here, you see clear brain components. So I'm going to dive into that. These are the first 10 components and we have our prototypical vertical horizontal eye movement. There's more vertical eye movement coming up, maybe even more. So if you look at those this is our vertical component, clear blink related activity. There's also a little bit of saccade in here. You see ICA was not able to dissociate pure vertical blink activity from horizontal movement. That's contained in this one component already. Was not able to dissociate that perfectly. You see these very strong um, changes in amplitude very rapidly appearing over some trials. Clear location in or near the eyes, clear power spectrum and indicative of an eye component. So the same here for the horizontal eye movement and then there are more eye movements again blink you see that and here for this obviously a little bit of muscle is involved. So again and that makes sense your eye is moved by a lot of muscles, your lid is moved by muscle so if you close your eyes, if you move your eyes there will be muscle contraction that might be picked up by ICA and decomposed. There's another one um, see here saccadic eye movement um, that's clearly um, contained in this IC and you can see that here rapid change um, and direction standing rapid change back so this is um, your classical pattern so okay I get my IC label results I use that to an automized um, labeling of my classes and these four ICs would be considered eye movements so I simply reject them from the data. So this is the magic of ICA, <laughs> so super nice. You have your sculpt data, you did the decomposition and now what you get is your ICA activation and the sculpt maps, your inverse W matrix, right? So what you can do now is you basically zero out all the component in the ICA activation and your sculpt map and then you multiply the two matrices and you get back to the sculpt data but this time you get rid of the eye movement so it's not in the data anymore. So this is a cleaning process based on ICA. It's um, super straightforward, easy, very nice and what you can see hopefully again very thin, uh, thin traces here is the red signal would be the clean signal overlaid on the blue which is the original signal and what you can see is there's no eye data contained anymore. So look at the scale if I now plot the same event related potential that we started with 
it's going to be reduced by half, right? Eye movements are gone, high energy signal, amplitudes are reduced by half. So if you look at the EOG, that already looks like an ERP. There's no eye movement anymore. And you still have electrodes that record brain activity, right? They also record brain activity. If you get rid of the eye movements in that channel, you now have a functional um, channel showing you brain activity. And that is POZ. And you see this very beautiful P1N1, P2-ish, P3 complex here didn't change much, and I can show you that. So in blue you see the um, uncleaned IC data, in red you see the data that was cleaned with removing all eye components with a likelihood more than 90% of being an eye. So but now I got curious. Um, so I think this looks like a little bit like eye, and maybe this was incorrectly labeled, right? So what is that actually? And what is that? Could also be kind of an eye component. So let's look into that. Um, it's not really indicative of like an eye component if I look at the spectrum. There seem to be some blink activity potentially. I would have to overlay that with the sensor data. There's kind of an uh, event related potential activity here. And the dipole is clearly um, not in the brain. It's more close to the eye. So well, let's get rid of that. Why would I keep it? And see, it doesn't change much. The signal is minimally impacted by this one component removal. And then I just go on. Then if I don't want to have eyes, I'm not interested in muscles. Why would I look at muscles if I look at ERP? So get rid of muscle and nothing changes. So that's good, right? The signal to noise ratio improves step by step. I reduce the noise. I get a better signal-to-noise ratio for my ERP, and then I finally ask the question, if I just get rid of everything but brain, so what would that look like? Again, this is my original non-clean data. This is eye movement one, eye movement two, get rid of muscles two, and now there's brain activity only. And this looks pretty good to me. I could assume now, theoretically, I have only brain activity. And that seems to work for traditional desktop experiments, very well, I argue, right? This is another example. Um, very frontal electrode, um, left lateralized, frontal central. You see that the eye movement contribute a large part, portion to the data, and that you have a very nice signal to noise ratio here in these components. If you look at eye uh, brain activity only, devoid of any um, other activity. So, perfect. And in addition to that, if you get uh, uh, a deeper look into the frequency domain, that picture seems to repeat, right? This is the unclean data at POZ, and you see this um, upper trace here is your event-related spectral perturbation. So on the x-axis you have frequency, uh, uh, x-axis time, uh, y-axis frequency, sorry, and you see this um, strong synchronization in red colors, you see the dB scale here on the right side, and desynchronization in blue colors, colder colors here. What you see in the unclean data is that you have a pronounced synchronization in the higher frequency range. This is what we would expect from muscle activity, right? And down here you see the intertrial coherence pattern. Again, this is coherence on the um, y-axis over time x-axis. Um, and you see a very strong phase resetting here, strong low power frequency range starts at 15 hertz. I can see it from here exactly, but it's very high because the segment was not really long. So now I remove all the eyes and some of the muscles, but not all the other components that were not clearly labeled as eye and muscle. And now I remove everything but brain. And what you see is all the broadband high frequency synchronization disappear. I have a nice desynchronization in the lower frequency range of the entire time period after stimulus encoding. So this seems to fit pretty well with, with what we know. So um, in the end, I would argue, great. So why don't you just remove everything but brain? And this might work to a certain degree for traditional desktop experiments. And in the end, so you might ask, so what um, I can do that, no worries, everything works. Um, now I'm going to show you that this might be a different story for mobile brain body imaging. And as I said in the introduction, obviously, if we move, there will be more eye movement, there will be more muscle activity, there will be lots of more things happening that we don't know from desktop experiments.
So if we look at a clear Mobi data set, and this is an example that's pretty much um, a twinning project here, that's a twin brain project. This is our setup in Berlin, where we look into healthy, um, older and younger participants and hearing impaired older participants. And they do uh, a walking task, walking dual task with two different secondary task dimensions, uh, modalities basically. One secondary task is an auditor auditory task and the second um, secondary task is a visual task and then we have like the primary task as walking. This is basically mimicked here in um, COPA and in Trieste looking into Parkinson patients, um, looking into brain dynamics during walking and so this is um, um, the very exciting part of this twin brain project um, which I'm very much looking forward to learning more about the patient data. So this is a setup, you see the EEG, you see we had like this goggles prepared and 3D printed thanks to Andreas in Hamburg and Betty. Um, so we had like these LEDs and we can have like a secondary visual test lighting up LEDs in different colors, different frequencies, whatever. At the same time they're wearing like headphones and have EEG on top of that and they respond with these controllers. We do have a gate ride system here, so it's an optical gate tracking system. And um, with that, that's matched more or less um, here um, in Slovenia and we can compare the data and get it together. So what do you get from this kind of data? This is a decomposition, the first 10 components I show you and beautifully, like what you see is a vertical eye component, a horizontal eye component to Weird thing is, uh, more likely a brain component. So you see, it looks very ni nice. It's a nice decomposition. So look at that. It is the perfect eye component here. In this case, you see it's event related based on the onset of the secondary task. In this case, the auditory task, secondary task. Um, the data is filtered with 50 hertz. This is why you see the steep um, um, decrease here in the end, um, about 50 hertz. So remember, as um, already, uh, uh, Valentina said, um, your filter will distort your signal. So be aware of that. If you filter with 50 Hz, it's not going to affect 50 Hz only, but it's going to affect already frequencies below 50 Hz. So be aware of what kind of filter settings you use. Um, the location clearly in the, in the brain and you see uh, uh, clearly in the eye region and that's the same for the horizontal component. Both are labeled as eye components. So look at the ERP, uh, that's a disaster. Uh, look at the scale, it's like 25 <laughs> microvolt. Uh, so it's basically just large eye movements the way it looks like. So this is the plot for the frontal uh, frontopolar or the EOG channel. And this is the POZ channel. There's um, in comparison not much going on. And the first glance that you have at this event related potential is it's not as beautiful anymore as the ones that we saw previously. It's not a standard ERP. It's kind of different to compare, uh, difficult to compare. This is our uncleaned CP5. I'm going to central parietal left hemisphere electrode because this might reflect auditory processing. So we're looking at some kind of evoked activity here. Um, this is now the clean data, removing the eye activity from the data and you see that there seemed to be systematic blink activity at the beginning and in the end beautifully clean that worked well and there seems to be still like an emergent component here shortly before 500 milliseconds looks pretty good so now remove um, the second batch of potential eye components maybe mislabeled doesn't change much and now we remove eye and muscle ICs and look doesn't change much. That's pretty cool actually for a, uh, an experiment like that, right? So we're talking about walking participants. But if I now remove everything but brain, the signal massively reduces. And this is a real problem. So now I have to ask the question, what contributes to an ERP in a mobile condition? Would event-related potentials in mobile conditions even look the same they do in traditional desktop scenarios? Um, so there are several questions we have to ask in these kind of scenarios. And this is like a specifically bad case that I'm going to show you, I have to say. Um, and I'm going to show you the eye movement component only, right? So if you take only the eye movements and plot the event-related potential, you see that most of this activity here is 
uh, originating from eye movement as seen in the blue dotted line. And again, the second very large component that you see here in the back is produced only by eye movements. If you remove the eye movements, you get this kind of a component here. But the gap between this first peak and all these um, um, cleaning um, data, or this clean data and this peak, uh, this peak, I'm sorry, here, this is uh, difficult to explain. And it clearly raises the question, should you remove everything but brain? And I would argue this is not possible um, for mobile brain body imaging data. This is POZ, different electrode, same idea. You have the same eye movement still being present or plus mechanical artifacts being present here. Um, and if you remove everything but brain, you see that the amplitudes are massively reduced. So there seem to be systematic contributions from other ICs that are not labeled brain, but contribute to this kind of peak. Okay, and this is a simple explanation. This is simply a most likely incorrect labeling of IC label, plus problems with the head model, plus problems um, with um, 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 the data itself, um, the noise in the data. So what you see here is two components that are pretty similar, labeled ones as muscle, ones as other. Then there is another other, that's our left sternocleidomastoid and the right uh, sternocleidomastoid, both labeled as other, not as muscle. So if you look at those, um, what you can see here, the first two um, seem to be muscle. They are kind of outside the head, but you see that strong, 10 hertz peak that is indicative of brain activity, but it's not 1 over F. So this part here would be indicative of muscle. And the location is pretty borderline. It could be a bad located occipital cortex, could be a visual component, something like that would be necessary for gait. Could also be a neck muscle. As I said, neck muscles are not included in the head model. So classification here is difficult. And here you see the contralateral example. It's more or less the same, even though it is more or less the same location-wise, spectrum-wise, activity-wise, and pattern-wise over time, it's labeled differently. And this is one of the reasons why um, IC label might have difficulties with Mobi data, because it was not trained on Mobi data mainly. And this is why we started um, IC Mobi. So this is um, an example for the sternocleidomastoid. Here you see clear muscle activity, but there seem to be potential mixes with other um, um, frequency ranges, potentially other functional processes in this decomposition where ICA was not able to clearly decompose muscle from brain or from other processes. So why is this? Um, again, I think there might be a few model assumptions in independent component analysis that might fail here, non-stationarity of the signal, for example. Um, IC label results as it was not trained on mobile brain body imaging data. Head models that do not include um, neck muscle or eyes in the source space or supracranial muscles for that matter. Um, there's no ground truth for MOBI data. The simple question is what, what happens to our brain and how does our brain control secondary tasks while walking, while behaving actively, constantly monitoring movement in space? Will that change the, the data and the, the way we look at data? We will have to basically build new ground truth data. We will have to replicate tons of experiments to get to a reliable estimate, to robust estimates of components in event-related potentials. So, in summary, what I showed you is we do have EEG data, continuous data, that is contaminated with tons of activity that we might not be interested in. Then we do some magic. Um, in this case, it's ICA. It's not magic at all. It's a mathematical model. It has assumptions and you have to check your assumptions. Whatever kind of model you use, you decompose the data, check the model assumptions and whether they work. ICA model assumptions seem to work largely and they allow dissociation of brain and non-brain, which is specifically of interest to MOBI um, data. Then basically using the information, making more objective pre-processing pipelines, classification of components, all that will be very helpful in getting a more objective approach to data analysis of complex data. And with that, you can clean your data, whichever way you want. And you have to ask your question how you want to do that.
Do you want to focus on brain? Do you want to focus on ERPs? Do you want to focus on other aspects of the data? And what would that mean for your cleaning approach? And I think one of the most important points I'm trying to make here today is that there is not one cleaning approach, um, quoting Mansa Pesca. And this is specifically the case for mobile data as compared to stationary data. If you look at the same visual input that you see here, we have a monitor where, you, where participants basically rotated um, uh, according to a sphere moving around them. And we did that on a monitor. This is a traditional setup. And this is like the Mobi setup. Then it is obvious that there will be different contributions of eye and muscles to the signal. And this will result in different data quality and different event-related potentials. So be aware what you're doing and what you can expect in your experiments and the data. So data cleaning with ICA should consider what is analyzed. If you're interested in ERP, then I think it's fair to say eye movement or components that reflect eye movements are very well identified by ICA. You can remove that. It's a very good cleaning approach. If the signal can be potentially filtered um, to be less impacted by muscle activity, as Valentina said. 20 hertz filter might be harsh, 30 hertz filter. Again, muscle activity is broadband high frequency. If you can filter the data, you might not even have to remove components. So why think about removing muscle if you don't get that signal into your ERP? If a specific class on top of that is systematically related to the onset, which muscles might not be, right? So if, if it's not like a specific movement that every time happens with onset of stimulus, then muscle activity should not be time locked to the event. And in that case, should average out in the ERP, you might not have to remove those components. And if it's not event related, you might be careful with the removal. You might also simply keep them. If you don't know what it is, and that's a very conservative approach to it, if you can't identify what the IC does, if you don't know whether it's functional or not, it might be better not to remove it. And disclaimer, this is all my personal view. So there might be other opinions on that, but this is what we have learned over time from our data-driven approaches of more than 15 years mobile brain body imaging now. And I think um, this is one aspect you might consider. For time frequency analysis, if induced in power is of interest, then single trial high energy signals might be problematic. So muscle activity here now becomes a real problem. Um, and um, if the signal can be filtered again, this might not be a problem for you at all. You don't have to remove anything. If event related power is of interest, um, then I see that systematically vary with the onset of the event should be removed if they're non-functional for you, but be careful with removal if you're not really sure. So again, if the frequency is not of interest, you might filter or it might basically be averaged out across trials. If you're not sure, don't remove it. Okay, and with that, again, disclaimer, um, there's no one recipe for EG analysis. I think we approximate um, with our Berlin pipeline to pre-process MEG data uh, a very good objective way of analyzing and pre-processing data and cleaning data with Amica. Um, Amica has a very robust and very well working um, um, time domain cleaning, so log likelihood removal of um, um, data points that works am amazingly well. So um, you can use ICA to remove eye components because that is absolutely safe. Um, for anything else, you really have to consider what is the main question of your experiment, what do you want to answer. And as the end, uh, in the end, the message really is um, we have to replicate protocols. We have to share protocols, share your pipelines, share your data so that other labs can replicate with different analysis approaches what we get from mobile brain body imaging data to come to robust descriptions of parameters. And so with that, um, I hope I could give you an insight a different converging insight to traditional desktop analysis approaches coming from a mobile brain body imaging side. And I hope um, this is helpful for you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus, for an exciting and excellent talk. Really, um, we are um, 
going into a direction that is relatively new, as you mentioned. Um, it's been 15 years that the MOBI approach has started emerging and we are continuously trying to um, find new options, new opportunities, new um, multi multimodal data analysis approaches to better understand the natural cognition. Um, could you maybe reflect a little bit on uh, how many independent components usually reflect uh, the signal, so the brain signal? Um, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Usually, um, so in desktop experiments, we often have like, I don't know, 10 to sometimes 20 components. That would be the range if you have very clean data. I would, would expect um, potentially somewhere between 10 and 20 components to reflect brain activity. In Mobi data, that sometimes is reduced. And we, in some experiments, for some participants, might end up with six or seven clear brain components. But as I said, this might simply be due to ICA not being able to decompose um, um, processes and you might have brain activity together with muscle activity in one of the components. So uh, it's a distribution of functional activity of the brain across um, different classes, I would argue. And what would you say that the effect of the chosen task is on the number of ICs, brain ICs that you are then did you end up with after the decomposition? Well, theoretically none, <laughs> because all brain um, areas, all structures should be active to a certain degree. Um, but you pronounce obviously with like strong visual input response in um, occipital cortex, for example, or auditory um, input to temporal cortex. But this should only alter the amplitude, the energy that these components might contribute to the data at a given time point. Um, I would not expect too much changes depending on the modality. If you have a clear desktop setup, I would not expect too much to differ. For Mobi now, we don't know um, because we simply don't know how much new components might appear. The question then is, um, if you actively behave, does that change the brain dynamics? And this seems to be the case if you look at several single cell recordings in animals that the behavioral state changes the firing rate of specific um, neurons that are not directly associated with motor control. We might expect that movement, active behavior might actually trigger processes that we might not have recorded in previous desktop experiments. So in that sense, we might even expect more or different kinds of ICs. Thank you. Um, if we go a little bit, if we touch upon uh, dipole location and think about that there is a, um, a huge intra-subject variability in terms of the cortical folding, the um, shape of the brain and so on and so forth. So how important it is that uh, we get individual um, MNI coordinates when doing the dipole localization? With individual coordinates you mean individual head models? Exactly, yeah. Um, uh, this is um, it's a very good question. I think uh, I remember Martin Zeber talking about this, um, and I think for our standard approaches it's not necessary um, because the information gain that we get from a lot of more work, you know, um, creating individual head models from MR scans, diffusion tractor, whatever kind of information we get, um, this increase in information about the location is not that high um, to justify the additional work that you have to put in there. If we're talking about patients, that might be a different story. Um, but for standard um, experimental approaches, I think we are very good with localizing electrode locations. That is a huge improvement. High density EEG recordings with individual um, um, measured electrode locations and then warping the head model to the electrode location but not the electrode location to the um, standard head model. That already improves um, the um, source reconstruction accuracy significantly. Everything beyond that might be you know, difficult um, regarding the time and work you have to put into. Okay, thanks. So given the uh, today's advancements in the measuring equipment and the signal processing techniques and so on and so forth, um, what would you then say is the maximum spatial accuracy um, of estimated source location? So what's this deviation from the ground truth that we are so um, eagerly trying to get to? <laughs> 
Well, I think uh, we can say with certainty that we are in the range um, up to two centimeter, and sometimes we have um, an accuracy around one centimeter, I would argue. But one centimeter can be a lot, right? That can decide whether you're pre or post central um, gyrus. So it's still an approximation. And obviously it would be nice to have converging evidence from other imaging modalities for the same task, but as we are here, EG and FNIRS are the only modalities to record in actively behaving participants. All right. So if you compare, for example, s or e -Lorita, um, in terms of precision, um, how can you, can you comment on that a little bit in terms of... I have not been working sufficiently to make uh, a good um, 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 judgment here. I do remember Martin talking about that also. And if I remember correctly, I think E. Loretta was slightly preferred over S. Loretta. But this is like, um, again, it's so S. Loretta as a distributed source reconstruction approach is a different approach than um, using dipole localization, right? So in that sense, um, it is a, um, a different way of trying to localize activity in the brain. And the differences between the two approaches might, you know, um, be very fine-grained with respect to specific questions you have in the source reconstruction. But if you compare, for example, um, whatever, um, so S or E Lorita, compared to the ICA or the Amica decomposition, um, if we reflect, reflect on this comparison? Uh, that's a, a very good, um, um, different approach. Um, um, so equivalent dipole modeling um, with ICA is based on the results of the ICA, as Loretta is not. You just take the sensor signal and reconstruct distributed sources in the brain. So in that sense, it's a different direction. You're approaching the same question with. Um, so you're independent of ICA. Um, you can use ICA as a cleaning um, moment before um, S. Loretta or E. Loretta and then try to get to a more spatially um, you know, distributed source reconstruction approach in that sense. Yes. Okay, so there seemed to be a little bit of confusion around like 10 minutes into the second part of, the, of, oh. of your talk. Um, I don't know if we can like locate the slide, but you showed the continuous data and on the Y axis, did data refer to the independent components or to the electrodes? 10 minutes into my talk. Approximately, that's my estimate. <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, the person who has been asking the question, can the person ask, uh, state the slide? 10 minutes into my talk. Um, that's so I think this was already, this was still the first part of your talk. In the second part, well, yeah. I am um, so I can't this this guy here or. Yeah, I I think it might be a bit hard for us to track this back right okay. now, but okay. Okay. Um, in the experiments with head-mounted display and the headphones, uh, doesn't the proximity of such electrical devices mm. uh, disturb the measured EEG? Yes, totally. Good question. It does, actually. There's a very specific um, a number of different frequencies that um, you can show with ICA um, to show up in several components. One is around um, 98 point something. That's the refresh rate of the display itself. But then there's onboard electronics, so several peaks. But you can, um, and Marius Klug in our group has done a significant improvement of um, zap line, so he does he did include the Zepline Plus um, algorithm. Um, it's a frequency decomposition approach to detect artifacts and remove them automatically. Um, so you can deal with these artifacts, is what I'm saying. They are there, but using the right algorithms, you can get rid of them um, without losing information in the signal. Okay. Um, does this signal get decomposed in a specific ICA component? So given it wouldn't be removed with the Zepline Plus, for example, do you think it could have been um, decomposed in a specific um, independent component, this electrical device disturbances and so on? Theoretically, it could. Um, but again, due to movement, this might also, you know, change the spatial filter over time and it might end up you know, in a number of components. So if you look at the spectrum, some participants, you see like several peaks in the frequency around 89 hertz, for example, but also lower. And you could 
theoretically end up with like five to even more if there's movement in the system um, components to explain that, yes. Okay, so um, for example, I was just thinking like when we were navigating real life, right? Uh, yeah, we look around, our um, eyes obviously contribute functional information as we nicely established here today. Um, but then it puzzles me because in the end, we always end up removing the eye components from the data, right? Uh -huh. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that would be my suggestion, actually, to look at eye movement. Um, and I, I, I showed what ICA can do, right? You couldn't just decompose your data and then just collect all the components that you're interested in and back project them to the sensor level or investigate only those components on the source level. So there's so many options to work with the signal. I would look at the eye movements because they tell. Uh, a lot. They tell a real story about what's going on in the experiment. So in that sense, I think we're missing out on um, a high dimensional information space. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you a lot for um, this excellent talk, really, again. And thank you for being here in person with us.